Hi, folks. I think we'll get started here. Um, I'm Tom Ferguson, and this is the panel, uh, which is, I think, not typical on economics conferences, which is how did economics crowd out good economics, evidence from citation analysis. Now, I, I actually don't want to be talking. You're here to hear the panelists, but I would like to explain what the basic idea behind this panel is. Um, because it's maybe not quite so obvious. Years ago, when I was a grad student doing actually economics and politics at Princeton, I took Thomas Kuhn's course and Carl Hempel's courses in the history of science. And uh, at that time, Kuhn was proposing that famous paradigm discussion. And his idea of how you knew you had a paradigm was, alas, purely behavioral. That is to say, if there was not much dissent or no dissent, it was science. Um, now he, when you pushed him on that, would say, now that's not really what I meant at all. It's an intellectual thing. And I told him plainly at the time, I said, this is going to turn the social sciences into a sort of kind of iron cage uh, in which everybody's going to try to become scientific uh, by just getting rid of dissent. Uh, and that, I think, is precisely how things developed. Uh, and uh, you all know, I mean, you can sort of see, if you just step back, um, when, you, when you deal with most people who want to do citation analysis, they treat it the way Hegel did uh, in the sort of the world spirit, the march of God on earth. And it's like, there's the citation analysis, and it's got to be just wonderful, right? I mean, otherwise you would have, I mean, so, sometimes you get a more or less implicit, and on rare occasions, explicit uh, version uh, of these wisdom of crowds. No, my experience with crowds is that they're not very wise, and I would have thought, I mean, what what'd you see in 2008? Do you think that was really an exercise in supreme intelligence? Um, anyway, um, the, so uh, we were looking at this in INET, and you know we basically take the view that there's obviously something wrong with conventional economics. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have had 2008. You wouldn't have had people telling you that the uh, only thing uh, you know, you, the only thing you need to do for market regulation is leave it to the reputation of the folks involved, <laughs> which of course, I mean. <laughs> Uh, at maybe a meeting in Monaco now <laughs> from the folks with their ill-gotten gains. Uh, but uh, you wouldn't have had people doing real business cycle theory where the difference between uh, potential output and actual output is almost by definition <laughs> whatever is the output. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what, when you look at those Hoderick Prescott filters and things like that hard, that's what you get. Uh, and above all, you wouldn't have had the rational expectations uh, theories where you have people looking forward through infinitely numbers of, infinite numbers of uh, future uh, worlds, typically uh, sets of markets you know, where everybody's hedged indefinitely into the future. I mean, it's like, come on, guys. How did this happen? Um, and so the approach, we're sort of taken to citation analysis, and we're actually doing some research on this. Uh, these people are doing the research on this. Um, is how did this happen? And it's not, the evidence is not about um, just because it's there and that's what was in the journals, that it must have been wonderful. Uh, that's the first sort of uh, point to be made. Um, and we are also taking the view that uh, lots, it, it, as, as if you look around the world, now this started out as typical in the Anglo-Saxon world as it so often does, it's informal, though with, as though it might have been ordained by a ministry of truth. Uh, lots of folks now use as their promotion criteria for uh, jobs, you gotta publish in a small list of journals. And they simply count points. This also does relieve the promotion committees of any need to read the pieces. And it's often cited as an advantage. Now, typically, the only people who will admit to this are in business schools uh, rather than economics uh, per se. But in fact, plenty of them say it. Um, and this, however, went from the Anglo-Saxon world to the American side uh, in its informal guise to become quite formal in a number of European countries. 
Uh, France has a scheme like that. Um, it's become controversial. Italy just put in a scheme. Uh, some months ago, we put up on the INET website Luigi Passanetti's great descent from that initial report where they sort of recommended this some years ago. Uh, I think an honest person who looks at this stuff will quickly discover that uh, the, the often the decision to move to a formal set of journals like that is often tied up with a lot of other political events. Uh, and that you know, on the surface appear to have very little to do with economics. Uh, but at any rate, um, we thought at INET it was time to open up this whole discussion. And we'd like to find out what the consequences are of going uh, to a small list of journals. We want to find out what the actual citation patterns were, and we want to find out some of the pitfalls. Uh, it's already obvious, for example, that there are bubbles in citation analysis that you can, editors and else others can uh, maneuver. Um, that, you know, if, if you like the old Goodhart's law about, you know, the definition of money or regulation in banks, that is to say, whatever you do, they'll focus on that and find a way around it. This is very clearly happening in journal citation indexes, and I think the evidence on this is already <laughs> quite clear though it is not yet published. So this is what this thing is about. It's not to tell you how wonderful things have been for the last 30 years, and the proof of it is because everybody cited um, Prescott uh, or somebody. Uh, it's to, like, how did this happen, and how did you end up in 2008 with theories that were obviously foolish, uh, having the domination uh, in the field, all right? So we will just, we finally decided to go in alphabetical order. Uh, so it's Carlo de Bellini starts off. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what I'm going to present uh, is, uh, first of all, a good news. Okay, can we have the presentation, sir? It's the poly Yes, great, thank you. Uh, I was told it's always uh, the case that you have to start with good news. And the good news is that if you measure the quality of economics from the number of citations that it receives, we are improving. So economics is getting better, it appears. Uh, how can we say that? Uh, if we look at the median impact factor of journals in economics, you see over time an, an increase in trend. If you considered instead all economic <coughs> articles as if they were published within a single journal, this journal would have a clearly improving impact factor. So uh, really, we are getting better and, do, and doing our things. Uh, of course, this is not really the case. What is going on is that the number of journals that compose the database from which citations are counted is increasing. As a consequence, it appears that the number of citations is, is increasing too. Uh, but unfortunately, as you can see, uh, the rate of change is even lower for citations than uh, for, than for, for journals. And if I had put articles in, you would have even a more increasing trend because the number of articles per journal is increasing too. What does it tell you? Uh, it just tells you that the impact factor, which you will know, is um, more or less the average number of citations that each uh, article within a journal receives, is a biased measure of visibility, of quality, of whatever you want to consider it. Uh, it suffers from a number of well-known uh, biases. Among the, 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 the major ones, it is very difficult to interpret because um, it only counts citations within the first two years after publication of an article. Uh, it doesn't really distinguish between favorable citations and criticisms of an article. Uh, it is well known that the distribution of citations uh, of, of with, for the articles within the same journal is very asymmetric and very skewed, so that the average doesn't really mean uh, a lot. Uh, it, it can be shown that it's very field specific. So, for example, uh, the best economist is never as much cited as even a, a low ranking uh, biologist, physicist, or, or any other scientist. Uh, it is very easy to uh, bypass or till the system in various ways. You have examples of journals that just have increasable, uh, I mean, in, in unbelievable jumps from one year to the other in the impact factor. Uh, 
even uh, it is not really clear how are impact factors measured. Uh, several researchers tried to count citations and reproduce the number, and the number are never the same f with the official ones. And Thomson Reuters, which is the private corporation that computes impact factors, was never really able to explain uh, how is it possible, how is it possible that you cannot reproduce the number that they mention. And uh, it also suffers from a number of confounding factors. For example, um, it's, it's a very well-known fact that review articles receive a lot more citations than original research articles. But can you really say that original research is less good than, than review articles? So these are uh, what, uh, paraphrasing uh, Donald Raspelt, we could call uh, the known knowns of, of impact factors, the things that we know that we know. Uh, so just going very quickly on this, for example, one of the stylized facts uh, of scientometrics is that 15% uh, of the articles published in a certain journal normally receive half of the citation of that journal. If you think about it, it means that 85% of the articles within a journal receive less citations than what the impact factor would suggest. Uh, I leave it to you to imply what does it mean then the impact factor for, for a certain journal. Uh, another of the stylized facts is that if you really want to uh, know how many citations will, will uh, a publication um, receive over, over time, you need to wait at least five years. Because uh, if you just think of economics, uh, how long does it take to write an article? Then how long <coughs> between the first submission and the final acceptance? And how long between acceptance and actual publication of an article? It is pretty obvious that two years are not enough. As a consequence, what are the uh, citations that really count towards the impact factors? Well, they are those that you only add at the very last minute, probably because the referee or the editors uh, asked you. And those uh, citations that you really put because you worked on that for years, maybe, because you built on previous research, do not count, because only the first two years count towards the impact factor. Um, but, well, I, didn't, I don't want you to think that this is just a problem of the impact factor. I have 15 minutes, so I, I cannot go on with all the various measures that have been produced, but it can be shown that all, basically, uh, scientific uh, metrics of citations suffer from some kind of bias. For example, the very well-known age index doesn't uh, enjoy a property of transitivity. So if two scholars write together something, then it might be that the age factor of the, um, the age index, sorry, of the scholar with less citations become higher than uh, the, the age index of the scholar with more citations. So you have a lot of these very, very well-known facts, uh, among which, as I was uh, shortly implying before, is that citations are systematically different uh, across fields. So for example, uh, it is also known that the, our hatred sociologists receive on average more citations than sociologists, than uh, economists, or we are also uh, less uh, cited than people working on finance, management, business, and even psychology. So ju just within the social sciences, you can think about what will happen if, if I also put there the, the hard sciences. Uh, then you, you, of course, have the even larger problem of what is the meaning of citations. This is just a recent review uh, of many possible interpretations of what does it mean if a paper cites another one. And again, I don't have time to go through this. But yet, we all know, as Thomas uh, was mentioning before, that in the US, in, uh, informally, in Europe, increasingly formally, bibliometrics is ever more used as a way to um, measure, in some sense, scientific quality. As a consequence, it is a, one of the major criteria for hiring decisions, tenure decisions, promotions, uh, etc. Uh, why is this the case? Well, formally, uh, this is the usual justification that you get. The number of scientific publications is increasing uh, at a, an exponential rate. And as the founder of, of basically Thompson, not of the EC, which is the Institute for Scientific Knowledge, uh, which was the first uh, developer of the impact factor, uh, clearly put down, most people today do not want or do not have the time to read everything. Uh, well. 
this, this may, of course, be part of the argument, uh, but you can also argue that it is this very system which is producing an increase on the number of publications. But indeed, if we look at the larger political economy of the citation business, what you observe is, for example, in Europe, a clearly decreasing trend uh, in the um, public financing of public research and of higher education institutions. Of course, this remains the, the, the bulk of financing in Europe. You measure it on the right-hand axis in, in my figure, but you, at the same time, you see a, 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 an increasing trend towards uh, a larger contribution from student fees, that's uh, the own resources of higher education sector, and <coughs> of what is being classified by Eurostat as a broad, which basically means a European project. Uh, so you have an overall conte context of austerity by national governments. It means that the public financing for research in real terms is stable or even decreasing in some countries. And basically, uh, it's also quite explicit in some cases, bibliometric is a way to understand where to cut, where to, uh, to leave uh, research, public resources for uh, research. Uh, but, if uh, you really had to make an argument about efficiency, if it was really about what has been called the audit culture, we need to uh, provide explanation to the taxpayer why is it uh, the case that they should pay for public research, well, then if you really want to distinguish those who are more productive in, in some sense from inactive researchers, it has been shown by Cristina Macuzzi and, and other colleagues for the case of Italy, but it can be shown also for other countries, that you do not really have to go into um, very complicated measures of quality based on citations. You could really look just at productivity, how many uh, research items have been published in the last few years. Really, that is already sufficient to distinguish those who are <coughs> active researchers from those who are not. Uh, well, okay, so these were what I call the uh, known knowns, but there are also, citing Ransfeld uh, again, uh, known unknowns, things that we know that we do not know. Uh, the first one is the increasing dissatisfaction among the hard uh, scientists toward bibliometrics. Uh, a recent a uh, survey by Nature showed that just one-fourth of uh, hard scientists uh, uh, very much like or are satisfied uh, with the way that metrics are used for promotion, for tenure, and for hiring decisions. That means that three-quarters are, are not. Uh, there is an increasing movement. Uh, at the beginning in 2012, uh, 75 associations met in San Francisco to uh, make a declaration on research assessments, uh, asking that uh, journal-based metrics are not used as a substitute for actual reading research papers. Uh, this movement is increasing. So the first of my unknown knowns uh, will be that we do not know where is this leading. It is, in some sense, uh, clear, I was discussing informally with a colleague uh, right before this presentation, that bibliometrics are here to stay, but there is also uh, an increasing movement in the hard sciences, and we know that economists always come a little bit later, uh, towards a, a, a critical stance towards this uh, kind of measures of quality. The other known unknown is, as I was saying, that we know there are ways to tilt the system, but we do not really know what is the impact of citations. So for example, there was this uh, very famous uh, 2012 article on science, uh, ranking journals by how much editors push authors to include citations to their old journal. Um, what was the impact of this, journal, of this uh, article? Where, for example, there is the very famous case of applied economics, which basically acquired a very bad reputation and is nowadays, for example, being excluded <coughs> by the list of top journals in, in many European countries, including Italy. But on the other hand, there are other journals, for example, the European Journal of Political Economy, mm -hmm. which acquired an impact factor after this article went out. So it's not really clear if and how uh, can we um, control for um, ways in which economists or, or in general scientists are trying to bypass or tilt the system. Of course, it's not just the editors, it's also the authors who try to uh, find new ways 
of dealing with the new reality. So there was um, last year an article in Research Policy uh, is please, is showing a, a survey among economists according to which more than half of economists, for example, uh, you see item number 12, more than half, 51.9%, refrain from actually reading the things that they cite in their papers. You have one-fifth uh, of economists who do not cite low-ranking journals, because that's unpolite. You don't want to cite uh, that. Uh, you have, um, for example, very high proportion of uh, people who admit cited, citing strategically. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and you have the problem of networks. This is one of the things on which uh, I will be working uh, this year, namely uh, how does uh, citation networks impact on uh, citation metrics. Uh, and then there are the unknown unknowns, things that we do not really know <laughs> if we really know them. The, the major one will be my argument is what is the impact on all these, on the way that economics is being, doing, is being done now. So there was a, a, a 2009 editorial on Kiklos which uh, uh, defined at least five consequences of citation metrics on the way economics is done now. The first one is an increasing push towards specialization. This was, of course, already going on since at least, we could say, the 18th century. But publication arguably uh, increased the pace of, speciali of specialization. You have uh, strategic behavior. You have incentives to deviate from the truth. Uh, and even what they call impossible demands, I would call an uneven playing field. Mm -hmm. Namely, for example, 81% uh, of the papers in the top five economic journals come from uh, autos which are located in the US. This means that all, for all the other countries, is much harder to publish there. Uh, so for even the, the, the same. Uh, survey I mentioned before, notice, for example, that a, a higher number of economists agree with the statement that you have to select a research topic on the basis of publication prospects rather than what you think is worth pushing. Now, we made um, a, a first test for the case of Italy, looking at how institutions uh, decided to select the publications that they submitted for evaluation by the government. What it came out is that you had, with respect to what we consider to be the universe, that is the number of publications by Italian economists included in Econlit, you have a much higher number of publications submitted for uh, evaluation in the fields of econometrics, on finance and management, at the expense of the history of economic thought, applied economics, economic policy. Uh, how this, of course, if institutions decided that this is what they want to showcase to the government, it is very clear that this is providing incentives <coughs> to economists towards do not study anymore the history of economic thought, rather try to write something in the econometrics field. Uh, this was, okay, it was shown, but I really don't have time, that the way that they make this decision was basically driven by the impact factor and by other uh, citation uh, measures. And one of the consequences was that institutions decided not to submit a lot of books and book chapters, but rather journal articles. So one of my uh, unknown unknowns with which I would like to, to leave the discussion for you will be that are really books not important in economics nowadays? Because arguably, in my, in my view, one of the two most important pieces of uh, economic research last year came from two books, Mariana Mazzucatos and uh, Piketty, of course. Also, the other uh, issue will be, OK, apart from the US, if we look at all the other countries, is it really in their interest to just confirm to the kind of uh, economies that uh, publishes in the top international journals? I made a very quick uh, ex example by looking at how many articles contained the word Italy or Europe in the top three uh, international journals and in the top three Italian journals. This is not surprising at all. Uh, the, the international journals more or less have around 6-7% of articles dealing with Italy, and this is more or less um, in line with Italy's GDP over uh, world GDP, whereas, of course, Italian journals focus a lot more on uh, Italian issues. So the issue really becomes is it in Italy's government interest to still have a debate on Italian economic policy? 
if this is the case, then really we should not push, push all Italian economies only to publish in the international journals. Otherwise, you really see uh, the debate will just fade off. So um, just to let you know, we are in the very beginning of April, more or less. Since uh, January, already three Italian journals have closed down. Uh, so it's more or less one per month. Uh, what will happen to the um, public debate on, on Italian economic policy? Thomas Ferguson, when I first met him, referred to the kind of economists that uh, publish on, I mean, to the idea that all Italian economists should be the kind of economists that publishes on the top international journals as colonial thinking. Indeed, uh, this shows that, okay, I think he thinks a lot, it tells already a lot. Uh, and also, if I should make an appeal to the self-interest of our uh, mainstream colleagues, I would say if we, in the context of austerity, really want to uh, push towards saying which heads will have to fall based on the number of citations, beware of the hatred sociologists and management people because they are higher than us. So even our own self-interest would kind of lead us to a rethinking of the whole issue, in my view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, <coughs> all right, the next speaker is Jakob Capella. Yeah, many thanks for the invitation. I'm speaking about two perspectives on citation metrics in economics, and the backdrop is that citation data is becoming increasingly popular. We have just heard that. And my basic punchline, my basic punchline for this talk is that citation data can be interpreted in two different ways. And these two different ways of interpretation give rise to very different characterizations of economic discourse. And in this talk, I will illustrate that claim uh, by referring to a series of empirical examples related to this economic discourse. And keep in mind, this is all work in progress, so it's a, a little preliminary. Um, so what is what is uh, scientometrics? Scientometrics is basically the study of the quantitative aspects of scientific communication. And <clears throat> that the quantitative data which arise from these scientometric investigations can be used in two ways. It can be used either positively or normatively. The positive way <clears throat> is to ask for the properties of scientific conversation and the development of scientific fields. <clears throat> and I would call this cognitive scientometrics, and the basic question is how do scientists interact with each other? How do they communicate with each other? The second approach to use scientometric data is to use it normatively to evaluate scientific performance. This is what Carlo was talking about. And I would like to call this evaluative scientometrics, and the basic question here is who is a good scientist? Just to give two examples of what I'm talking about, here is an example, a classical example for cognitive scientometrics uh, produced by Derek G. Soller Price uh, 50 years ago, and he was interested in the first question, how do scientists interact with each other? And he found in his sample of papers that academic at attention is unequally distributed. That's a classical result in scientometrics, which Carlo also already referred to. We find basically that at the bottom of the distribution of papers, there is a large bulk of neglected papers which are n n never cited or maybe cited <coughs> once, and at the top of the distribution, uh, the distribution of citations to papers follows a power law. Here's an example for evaluative scientometrics. It's basically a screenshot of Thomson Reuters' current uh, social citation report, which is based on the impact factor. The impact factor is basically a result of citation counting weighted by the number of published articles. And the general idea is that more citations signify more impact, and more impact signifies higher quality. Carlo was already talking about that extensively. The concerns in the scientometric literature about this procedure are uh, twofold. Uh, there is the question of validity. Is impact attention really a good proxy for quality? And the question of reactivity. Which effect does the implementation of evaluative scientometrics have on the scientific practice, on the actions made by researchers? I will provide three examples related to economic discourse, which refer to concentration within economics, reactivity, and diversity within economic discourse. And for each of these three examples, I will provide some explorative results, and they will always give you two interpretations of this data, one from the perspective of cognitive scientometrics and one from the perspective of evaluative scientometrics. Let's start with concentration. Here is 
a table from a recent paper in the Journal of Economic Perspectives by Foucault et al. In, in this paper, they ask uh, what role have interdisciplinary resources in three social science disciplines, economics, political science, and sociology. And the main finding is that economics tend to focus on economics. Uh, economists tend to focus on economics. So uh, econs tend to focus on their own subject, uh, comparably stronger as political scientists do or sociologists do, who, who import much more citations from other fields. So how would we interpret this finding, to give the first example of what I'm doing here? From the perspective of cognitive scientometrics, we would simply say, OK, economics discourse seems to be more self-contained and less open for interdisciplinary research. From the perspective of evaluative scientometrics, we have the finding that economic research is superior. Why? It gets cited by others, but it doesn't need others, doesn't need external input. So if we simply look at citation flows as a proxy for quality, we would say, OK, this statistic tells us that economics is better than the other social sciences because it's that it, it, it only relies on its own, doesn't need external input, while other disciplines import ideas from economics. Another perspective on the issue of concentration would be not to look at interdisciplinary relations, but on the properties of the internal economic discourse. So to ask how concentrated is the discourse within these disciplines. And, in this, uh, and uh, regarding this aspect, I will look at the example of the Economist's top five. So uh, the top five journals in economics, as Card and Della Vigna defined them in a recent paper, are the Journal of Political Economy, the QGE, the American Economic Review, Econometrica, and the Review of Economic Studies. And what I did is I took these five journals and looked um, <coughs> what proportion of citations, what share of total citations of these journals stem from either the journal itself, that's the violet bar, or from one of its four best buddies, that's the orange bar. And the four best buddies are defined as those journals with the closest link to the target journal, which <coughs> is in economics always for the four of the other top five. Yeah? Mm. So the best buddies of the QGE are the GPE, the AR, the Econometrica, and the Review of Economic Studies. And here we find a significant difference between economics and political science and sociology, because in economics, in the top journals, more than a quarter of citations stems from exactly these five top journals. Whereas when I compare this with the leading field journals in sociology and political science, they are, and I look for the four best bodies of these journals, they only make of roughly 14% of citations. So we could say economics is twice as concentrated as, uh, the, as political science and sociology. Again, we have two different interpretations of this data. First, you could argue from the perspective of cognitive scientometrics, hey, economic discourse at the very top is to a large extent self-contained and exhibits a strong hierarchical character. You could even speak maybe of groupthink here if a quarter of citation is only uh, stems from really uh, five journals. From the perspective of evaluative scientometrics, uh, then we get a different interpretation. We get a different result. We get the result that high quality research in economics is rather easy to locate since top journals must be very good in, in, in identifying quality since they get so many citations. Yeah? So from our perspective of evaluative centromatics, we would say, OK, these journals really have a really good screening procedure, and that's why they are so highly cited, and that's why they form such a condensed network. My second example relates to reactivity, and reactivity is the basic idea that measurement may change the behavior of the measured object. And in order to say something about reactivity, I will introduce a simple hypothesis on reactivity, saying that the introduction, or better spoken, the rise of genre rankings redistributes prestige and attention from single authors and contributions to the genre itself, since genres gain a greater visibility. And as a consequence, what we expect is that self-reinforcing effects related to attention in academia which drive these power laws, <laughs> we already observed, should affect journals more strongly and authors and individual contributions less, it, at least within top journals. So what does this mean? Which type of uh, change in citations patterns do we expect? To explain this, I'll show you this graph. These are the citations received by papers of the 
Transactions of the American Mathematical Society in 2003. And I just want to use this to illustrate that you see here this great bulk of journals, about 80% of journals in this case, which receive either zero or one citation. And what we expect if <coughs> really prestige is redistributed to journals, to top journals, then we would expect this bulk of neglected journals, to, uh, of neglected papers within the top journals to decrease, to decrease significantly. And the question is, does this happen in economics? And in order to answer this question, I compared a number of neglected papers, neglected papers with either zero or one citation, for three top journals in economics for the 1980s and recent period. And this is the result. So, <laughs> so you see that in the 1980s, we had, uh, that's the, the left bars, we had for the QGE, the GPE, and the AER, a share of the number of citations which receive zero, a uh, share of the number of papers which receive zero citations of about 20%, and the share of the number of citations which receive zero or one citations of about 30%. In recent times, this has dropped significantly. So for example, for the QGE in the, era, in the time span of 2004 to 2008, counting all citations up to 2013, you find one single paper that has zero citations. Uh, so we really see that reactivity works. Um, since, uh, so to say, the journal as a whole becomes more attractive and thereby the bulk of neglected papers decreases significantly. We can even take a closer look at that. Here are the citations. Uh, here are the citations to papers published in the AER in the 1980s and 2000 <laughs> and the recent period. And uh, we see that in both cases we have a similar overall pattern, but more citations in the recent literature. Recent literature is the orange uh, graph, and slightly fewer papers in the recent literature. And now there is the question: How are these additional citations uh, distributed? And we find that. Uh, the maximum number of citations grows by a factor of 2.25, the mean number of citations grows by a factor of about 3, and the median number of citations grows by a factor of about 3.8. So these are surely no Matthew effect-like properties. Uh, Self-reinforcing, the working, working routine of self-reinforcing effects in academic attention seem to have changed, and what we get is that for top genres economics, a new middle class arises, the rising tide really lifts all boats, boats in this context, and the medium-sized boats even rise faster than the big boats. Again, what's our interpretation of this? We have two interpretations, one from the perspective of cognitive synthromatics, which would basically say, yeah, the, hope, the hypothesis is not, is not too stupid, academic prestige is transferred to journals, which makes Matthew effects for authors and articles less pronounced within a top journal. Um, <coughs> and uh, gives more prestige to the journal itself. Evaluative scientomatics, on the other hand, would simply interpret this data in, whoa, we have become better. And we have become better in the sense that quality is rising, quality of papers is rising, and the average and median quality of papers is even rising faster than the quality of top papers in the district. Now I come to my third and last example related to diversity, or more specifically to diversity and interparadigmatic competition. And the question is here, how do mainstream and heterodox economists interact? Um, I started with this several years ago, so we'll start with some old data. We acquired data from Web of Science from 1989 to 2008, and we selected 26 genres, 13 top mainstream genres and 13 top heterodox genres, and we collected all cross citations between the sample of 26 journals. And then we ask uh, how that, uh, what citation behaviors uh, exhibit the heterodox genres and what citation behavior is exhibited by the orthodox genres. And here's the finding. We see that heterodox genres cite orthodox and heterodox sources in roughly equal shares, whereas <coughs> heterodoxy is, I would say, not really considered in the mainstream literature. You find here a value of 2.85. I should tell you that this 2.85% is uh, still driven by outliers. So three outliers in the sample of these 26 genres create 80% of the citations making up this 2.85%. So if you do them away, you have something about 0.8 or so. Um, 
again, we have two interpretations. From a cognitive viewpoint, we would say that heterodox economics is open for deviant ideas, or it's maybe pluralist, while mainstream economics is closed for alternative ideas and conceptions. What does the same data tell us from, from, tell us from the perspective of evaluative scientific metrics? Interpretation A is easy, mainstream economics is clearly superior, and heterodox economics must be quite crappy. Um, one possible argument here is to say, ah, economic discourse is really highly concentrated, we have already seen that, so maybe the neglect of heterodox journals is simply due to the fact uh, that they are somewhere down below in the ranking and it's not, so to say, active discrimination or ignorance. And in order to check for that, I've introduced a control group, a control group of 13 orthodox journals which have a similar ranking uh, than the heterodox journals, and we see uh, that <coughs> this control group <coughs> is cited much more often than the heterodox journals. So we have some evidence here for, so to say, active ignorance. And again, if we interpret this, uh, this data, we would say that, OK, uh, mainstream economics seems ignorant uh, about what its comp paradigmatic competitors do as a, the obvious interpretation from the perspective of cognitive scientometrics, whereas, again, evaluative scientometrics would simply say, OK, mainstream economics must be clearly superior if even the low-ranked orthodox journals are cited so much more than the divine journals. And regarding this final example, we can also relate this result to other empirical approaches which address the question, what does mainstream economics think about <coughs> heterodox economics? <laughs> And we can maybe, uh, so to say, assess the relative merit of these two interpretations. Is the pattern we observe a result of ignorance? Or is it simply a result of the superiority of mainstream economics? And one, uh, one possibility to cross-check this, uh, these, these different interpretations is to refer to the work of David Collander, who explicitly cared about this question or, or tried to answer this question, what does mainstream economics think about heterodox economics? And he would say, my honest answer to that question was that they don't think about it. For the most part, the mainstream is unaware of the existence of an outside the mainstream heterodoxy. So even from a qualitative viewpoint, we would find some support for the, for the interpretation of uh, cognitive scientometrics that mainstream economics is simply ignorant about what its paradigmatic competitors do. Thanks for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Our next speakers, uh, Leonard Seabrook and Cornell Banner, will, I guess, divide their time in yes, Solomonic right. fashion. Yes, yeah. um, I'll be quite, uh, quite, quite short in my time because, because, because what, I mean, the, the um, uh, idea here is a new uh, uh, grant, and we're doing a, a sort of a, a, a test case, case here. And it's um, interesting, we think, and um, in terms of uh, good news and bad news, we are going to, going to try and end on. Um, on a more sort of upbeat note, in terms in terms of what's going on in change change in journals, uh, the, the the team is five. I mean, is 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 a uh, five, and the uh, grant starts uh, quite soon. Uh, what what we've done 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 for today is sort of a test test case based, in, um, and uh, but in general, the grant is is trying trying to assess the ideas um, in terms of the content of the ideas and who's carrying the ideas and the power of those actors. And and so, in term, term, terms of the approach here, is really quite uh, mixed. And what I will show you is the, the general aims of the project. And I will talk through some of the methods in a very, very uh, a quick fashion, a quick clip. Uh, but in general, I mean, the uh, uh, idea here for the project is to do a long-term study of, of the role of ideas and who, has, and, uh, uh, and who carry, carries the ideas and their power. Um, and as you can see from the slides here, this is going on between 1964 and 2014, and to study their careers. Um, and networks. In order to, to do so, we have a sort of uh, attack here, which we're calling a, um, a three-pronged attack on methods. Um, the test case that you'll see in a moment, I mean, is, is actually only, only the third method here. Uh, but I'll talk in, uh, in quite a quick fashion about the first two. In terms of the first, first, first one here is really to try and trace the sequence analysis in terms of careers. Um, now, I've uh, done, done this a few times, and, um, and the person on the right up here um, he was actually in the room when I showed, showed, showed the slide, and he thought it was a bit creepy that I was some kind of, uh, you know, uh, old creep. Um, but in terms, in terms of method, he was actually, I mean, it's to code, code, code the careers, and to, I mean, and uh, in, terms of, in terms of what you can see here on the bottom here, it's 
that sort of a chain, 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 a chain, uh, a chain of D, a, uh, a chain of D, a chain of DNA, and have a team, team of people compared, and find out who is most, most alike and dislike. Um, and in order to do that, you code according to the work role. And, and so in terms, in, terms, in terms of what we're going to apply, apply in the project here is to uh, do this and to, find, and to find careers and how they're different. Um, and this has been done in a few different, different papers, and the slides are online and, uh, and in the memo as well. Um, and we're quite, and quite happy, happy to talk, talk, talk that uh, through. Um, also, network analysis is important here as well in trying to find out um, not only who carries ideas, but people who carry two ideas at the same time. Um, and the study here is from last year. And what we can find out here in terms of what's going, going on here is if, if you see the, um, at the black box up here, the G30 box up here, and the IIF box down here, the, uh, the four dudes in the middle here are, are actually um, arguing, I mean, um, in reports for two different ideas at the same time. That's so what we're trying, 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 trying. I mean, in terms, like in terms, in terms, in terms, in terms, in terms, in terms, in terms of study here is actually in part to find out um, not treating uh, ideas as being pure, uh, and trying, trying also to work out um, if you're carrying an idea, can you carry two, two ideas in order to maintain your turf and when you're when you're turf. No, sorry, I'm not being clear. Um, in terms of combining the two things, is is also possible. I mean, is an aim of the grant as well. And what we can see here is the IMF work, work teams and the IMF. And according, according to this, this study here, if you're important inside, inside I mean, <laughs> if you're inside, inside the ring here, um, in, term, in, terms, in terms of your career history, the chance of you having gone, I mean, the, the, the chance of having gone through revolving doors is very, very likely. I mean, I mean so the aim here again is to I mean, trace, 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 trace the careers and the networks and the ideas in terms, in, terms, in terms of journals, and I'll pass to Cornell for, the, uh, for this. Uh, thank you, Lance. So again, uh, reading off our... Yeah, okay, um, you have to be sort of near there. Sort of near, yeah, okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so reading off our uh, earlier work, uh, just to give you a taste of what um, yeah. our work here will be about, which will focus on the top journals uh, in macroeconomics. <coughs> according to um, American Economics Review, as well as uh, the reports of government consulting agencies, such as the Council of Economic Advisors um, in, the, in the US and um, uh, its counterpart in the UK. Uh, so this is a study that I've done on uh, the IMF's uh, thinking on fiscal policy during the crisis. And I coded all the citations uh, in the World Economic Outlook and the Global Fiscal Monitor. And uh, I coded them uh, by two schools of thought, uh, basically fiscal orthodoxy, uh, the typical treasury view, and the more sort of Keynesian-ish uh, reformist view in the IMF. And the point is, if you combine the content analysis, if you actually read the sources that the IMF finds important, um, and code them, and then you connect that to the uh, affiliation of the individual authors, you get a very accurate sense of what, according to the IMF, constitutes the relevant epistemic community on fiscal policy. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, and pointing out to what Len said earlier on, in, uh, the people who are in the middle, uh, fiscal affairs, IMF research, Harvard, they are the schizophrenics, right? These are institutions that supply both orthodox um, and uh, reformist uh, fiscal thinking. On the outside, you can identify it with accuracy, for example, who are purely uh, pure suppliers of reformist thinking, for example, the IMF uh, Monetary and Capital Markets, uh, UC Berkeley, Northwestern, on the other side, you see uh, people who are uh, suppliers of strictly um, orthodox thinking. So this method, by combining content analysis uh, and, um, and, and biographical analysis, um, combine that into networks, we get a sense of who's at the core and who's at the periphery of thinking in the IMF. It also enables us to see who the potential allies can be within this very mainstream uh, epistemic community. Now, um, taking this into what we do, um, looking at uh, we look at two historical periods as a test run of our methodology. 1969 to, to, to 1974, we call this the great transition, the transition from the post-war neo-Keynesian uh, <coughs> establishment to the monetarist new classical revolution. Um, and essentially what we've done, uh, we only did a citation analysis, and we're happy to uh, address questions on content, because we've actually read all the fiscal policy articles published in AER during this period. Now, this looks a bit uh, confusing and baroque, so we decided to, to go for Nordic design and simplify. 
So we got um, uh, this version. Uh, so here you see the, the, um, the, the citation patterns. The green, um, the green arrows signify positive citations and the, uh, the red arrows are negative ones. So here you see, during the, the late 60s, early 70s, you see the American Keynesians there with um, Alvin Hansen in the middle um, and, and their allies. Um, then the rise of the public choice school, uh, the Buchanan uh, 56 reference, becomes the sort of focal point. This is before Friedman, it's James Buchanan that matters the most in the, at the origins of neoliberalism. Um, then Hansen in the middle here. Then uh, at the five o'clock, you see a, a debate uh, on optimal <coughs> taxation with Diamond and, and Samuelson uh, locking, uh, locking swords, um, Lerner as well. Uh, so ta taxation and, and public choice are at the sort of like in the roots of neoliberalism. It's not the, the quantity of money as much as, as, as these guys are. And then, of course, the micro foundations, Phelps, uh, Sargent, uh, Lucas, um, and uh, the, big, um, the big node in the middle, uh, 1968, that's Milton Friedman. That's his classical AR piece in, uh, in 68. Um, the public choice school um, massively articulates itself in the early 1970s um, as, as well. Uh, and then, uh, of course, Philip uh, Kagan, you know, the arch macro neoliberal connecting these groups, connecting the micro foundations critique with the public choice. Um, and he becomes the, set, the, the focal point of all that. Now, the Ricardian equivalence, another mainstay of, um, of neoliberal fiscal thinking, um, of course, with John Muth, uh, 1960, um, that's a very theoretical piece. But what these other citations around him do is to transform his theoretical intuition into empirically testable propositions that supposedly uh, undermine the Keynesian consensus at the time. Um, now, um, what are the, the icons? I mean, snapping his, uh, uh, casually snapping his, um, his suspenders, that's Uncle Friedman here, uh, Uncle, Uncle Milton, uh, followed by, um, of course, on the, on, on the left, um, you recognize um, uh, Tom Sargent, known as the hammer uh, in some uh, circles. Um, basically, this is the quantitative theory of money and the micro, the micro foundations critique. Um, then that's Cardinal uh, Buchanan, uh, public choice. <laughs> uh, illustrative, he's at, he's at uh, 1150, uh, sounding the, the end of the Keynesian hour, um, <laughs> as you can see him. And then here, harrowed, uh, tired, and, and stressed out about the future of his school of thought <laughs> is, Alvin, is, um, is Alvin Hansen. Um, so um, just Paul to, Samuelson. sorry? The picture was Paul Samuelson. Uh, Paul Samuelson, sorry. My, yeah, uh, Freudian sleep. <laughs> so, uh, what are the findings on substance a little bit, right? So, how am I doing on time here? Yeah, fine, fine. I'm fine on time, yeah? yeah, yeah. Um, so, for the great transition, the findings are as follows. Contrary to conventional expectations, the Chicago school is important, but as important as the Chicago mandarins are the interlopers. A lot of guys that we haven't heard about from Carnegie Mellon, Penn State, and other schools, all assistant <coughs> professors, do most of the legwork. <laughs> proving Friedman, Sargent, and others right. So there is this kind of very interesting movement from the periphery to the core. We kind of know the story, but we identify who the actors are. The literature focuses on the iconic names and, and less so on who does the heavy work for the neoliberal cause. Second is that the, the strategies are multi-pronged, right? You have, uh, I'm going to sit down now because I can, um, and you can hear me better. So uh, we found that there are three strategies of, of the, new, the rise of neoliberals. The first is a camouflage. Uh, strategy. And these are the um, sort of young assistant profs in small schools who claim to be sophisticated Keynesians. This is what they claim to be, but the policy implications are it's all, uh, they basically say, I'm a sophisticated monetary, a sophisticated Keynesian, therefore I'm, the, I'm for the quantity of money approach. Um, or I'm for, for rational expectations. And this shouldn't be Keynesian, but it, sh but it is. And then they supposedly show how it happens. The second strategy is a strategy of co option. There is a lot of work trying to synthesize. This is before the new, the, the new neoclassical synthesis in the 80s, when supposedly Grant Mankiw synthesized Keynesian and new classical views. There's a lot of work trying to synthesize monetarism and neo-Keynesian work. And these are sort of um, people who respectfully try to, to, to um, walk around the Keynesian temple and not giving a lot of negative citations. Um, but they try to do this kind of a dealer uh, kind of work. And finally, there's the confrontation. That's what uh, Friedman and Sargent and others with Nobel Prizes and a lot, a lot better credentials do. 
and they go for hardcore attacks, um, <coughs> supported from the side by uh, a great deal of people who are assistant profs or graduate students um, who do the empirical work. So they're sh showing that rational expectations is not just a theoretical proposition, but it fits the American data. So there is a lot of this sort of empirical work being done uh, by these folks. The third pattern is that uh, the neoliberal attack focuses on, on three points. The fallacy of composition of the Keynesian uh, argument, which is replaced with microfoundations critique. The sticky wages and prices, which is replaced by rational expectations, um, uh, flexible wages and prices. And third, the, attack, the replacement of the Phillips curve with the NIRO, right? We kind of know all of that but, uh, from the broader literature, but um, in this case, we show that there is also empirical work being done with the structural equations that are riffed off of the MIT model, sort of proving the Keynesians wrong in their basic assumptions, right? And finally, is that yes, you have the, the usual suspects, um, you have the big guys, but you know, Tom Cargill and Len Rapping were as important as Sargent and Friedman in undermining this consensus. So we're bringing these undiscussed figures uh, on the ground. Some of them became right-wing cranks in the, by the 1980s and not doing actually any research and being think tankers, but they are as important for, for the origins of the story. Finally, the Keynesians did not surrender. I mean, there's this story the Keynesians gave up and they, they betrayed their cause. They do put up a good fight, especially defending the Council of Economic Advisors reports and so on and so forth, but it's an unfocused battle, we find. We, they did not defend the, the basic assumptions undermined by the early neoliberal revolution. Uh, they picked up battles with the Marxists uh, on income distribution, for example, um, and they did not, did not uh, defend the, the assumptions uh, wars. Now, for the great recalibration, we, and we end in a slightly more optimistic tone, the great recalibration post-08, or the great recanting, it should have been. We found out it was not, not as much. Um, so it's let's, it's yeah. yeah, if you could have yeah, yeah, right. um, So for the great recanting, as you can see here, the, the, uh, these are the roamers, right? Uh, the economic advisors for Obama, uh, just trying to justify the stimulus, using the, so creating the fiscal multiplier debate as the, as the focus of analysis. Um, and um, uh, their flow there, of course, Alberto Aracina, um, uh, trying to, you know, the expansionary austerity argument. Um, now let's, let's take out uh, uh, these this folks. And this is very interesting. New figures enter the stage. Of course, we know Michael Woodford, but what we don't know is this uh, Viking raider here uh, as much, Gauta Egerson, Fed, now at Brown. He basically uses the mainstream DSG models to argue for very robust fiscal expansion and uh, income distribution. Now, the literature says, Foucault and others, that the methods constrain the possibilities for fiscal expansion. We find that, essentially, you can recalibrate DSG to no end to make any kind of arguments you want. So there is a possibility for, a constrained possibility, for making, making um, the same points that the Neo-Keynesians were making in the 60s without ISLM and with DSG. And that's like one of the big findings that, that comes out from, um, from this approach. Um, next. Yeah. Uh, in, terms of the, um, um, in terms of the patterns, right? We have uh, Juan Conejo here, major revolution on taxation. He basically says capital income taxes should be increased dramatically while reducing taxation, tax income taxes, especially for the youth. So it's a, issues of distribution come to the forefront using mainstream methods and with mm. not so neoliberal findings, frankly. Mm. Um, and, and finally here, um, the great recalibrators, uh, this is Martin Eichenbaum. Uh, his study is the most cited uh, among the mainstream people. Uh, again, making arguments for expansion. But let's be careful with this, right? Most of the arguments for fiscal expansion are on tax cuts, not on government spending, not on, on government investment, right? And um, it's not so much an expansion uh, of expenditures, but, but tax reductions, which is still in line with the sort of early neoliberal uh, views and conservative politics uh, yeah. of the day. Um, now, in terms of citation patterns, let's, let's go to that a bit. Uh, again, red, red is negative, uh, green is positive. We see several patterns. First is that we call them the lovers. These are, you know, spreading love, uh, I love you uh, citations uh, all over. And that's concentrated a lot um, in, the, in the neoliberal camp. They cite each other to, to no end. I mean, uh, uh, there is a little bit of, of interlopers there, like there's sociologist Chuck, Chuck Tilly who emerges out of, out of the blue, but that's not the, the, the dominant one. Then there's the haters, and the, the haters tend to be the sort of left of the new Keynesian spectrum attacking the new, the new classicals. 
And that's very interesting. So there is this kind of emerging um, insurrection uh, on the left side of the spectrum. It's Berkeley and Northwestern are at the core of this pushback. Um, again, still within the mainstream. Um, moving on, um, the battlers. These are people who, um, who really uh, try to, uh, to forge a middle ground, uh, as many negative, almost as many negative uh, as positive citations. And that tends to be the strategy of the, let's call them the prudent new classical mainstream types, right? Who make arguments for fiscal expansion, but they try to be very respectful with the, with the uh, conservatives out there. Yeah. And, and finally, uh, not finally, uh, yeah. maestros, that's very different. Smets and Wouters, I mean, that's very, you know, very mainstream types. Uh, they're looking for love. They're looking for love uh, or fresh blood. We could have called them the vampires uh, because they cite a lot of assistant profs who publish very empirical stuff. Um, so in a way, um, our, although our overall finding is that the new, cla the new classical purists are on the defensive on fiscal policy, they really aren't the dominant force in AR. Mm. Um, uh, one of their strategies is to say, um, we are tired, we want more blood uh, yes. from young uh, uh, people. Right? And finally, the middle of the gigolos, these are, these are people who, as the name suggests, are very uh, promiscuous in their, um, in their citation patterns. Um, the, the citations tend to be predominantly positive, right? again, as the name suggests. Uh, there's a lot of love going on uh, and selective hate. Um, and they tend to, to sort of be the dealers between the emerging left New Keynesians and the old uh, orthodoxy in this, uh, yeah. in this network. Okay. Right, now if we were to compare the two periods, right, this is a different way of visualizing the networks. Um, as you can see here, this is the great transition and then the great recalibration. Um, Friedman is a, a loved figure, as you can see. Uh, most of the citations, uh, I love the snapping. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, most of the citations are neutral. Like people reference each other respectfully. This is the you know, the rising, the insurgents are, are polite people in the, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and of course, Friedman is the, the, the most loved. Now, he becomes a hate figure in AR. I mean, uh, a, lot of his, a lot of the arguments he stands for are cited negatively uh, in AR, as you can see uh, him there. Uh, same for Bomb Lucas. I mean, there's a lot of uh, red arrows of hate going their way. Um, and then you see here Eggerson and Woodward. As I said, he's the Icelandic left Keynesian, right? Uh, who's, who did his PhD with Krugman, right? right? He is, uh, he's, he's, as you can see here, a lot of love, and he's more important than, than uh, Bob Lucas is, right? That's big, right? There's, the, the Lucas critique is less important than the Viking critique, yeah, at this point. Um, so again, uh, the citations are also uh, very accurate. People know who they love and who they hate. There's no respect going on. There's a lot of silos. Uh, and um, you, know, you cite your allies, and you hate your enemies. Right? Whereas here, uh, it was a much more congenial kind of environment. So we don't know where this will lead us. So we'll end yeah. with the last slides. Um, so what are the take home lessons from this? That macro has settled into these kind of uh, warring tribes. Uh, we do see a dominant sort of left New Keynesian voice with a lot of unexpected possibilities on issues of distribution and on issues of how much the government can do, <coughs> albeit very heavily constrained by uh, the methodological approach that they are using. Uh, the second point, a related one, is uh, basically microeconometrics dominates AER. I mean, there's more articles on ice cream and traffic control than on fiscal policy, right? So there is a sort of like autist um, um, perception of reality among these people. But the one thing that's constant, yeah, they hate Lucas and they hate Friedman, but the one thing that endured is the micro foundations critique. That has not been abandoned in the, in the New Keynesian crowd. And it really limits their possibilities for different policy suggestions in their papers. And finally, I think one of the implications of, of this and the, the take homes is that we could, using this methodology, we could locate with pretty great accuracy who the potential allies for INET are within the mainstream, right? So, um, I mean, if indeed there is a change, right? To what extent, um, to what extent <coughs> those people can be co-opted, yeah? Um, so there is a sort of Machiavellic undertone to what we're doing here. Uh, we have to identify virtuous characters in the Machiavellic sense. Um, so who are these Trojan horses? Uh, we'll look not at AR, but also the, the other top journals and, and, and um, try to go be creeps, go through their CVs. Yeah. And the sequence analysis will tell us even more. What kind of sequence of events in your professional life predicts uh, your positioning on the left-right spectrum in, in macroeconomics. I will just uh, end by saying that 
I, we were very surprised to find out that things like the, the Phillips curve was resuscitated in AR, that um, the debates on taxation do not uh, tend to be the, the classical conservative ones, albeit income, uh, income taxation is treated more conservatively than corporate income taxation. Right? And, and finally, the dominant authors writing on fiscal policy are central bankers. Hmm. Look, thank you very much, all of you. Um, I'm obviously not going to disagree with these. I happen to be the commentator. I don't think I want to say that much. Just a few remarks, and then I'm going to just throw it open to the floor. Uh, we will experiment with the wisdom of crowds for whatever. Um, just a few comments. Um, I, uh, I like all these papers, and um, there's no point in uh, it's just stupid to pick small holes. Um, I, I would offer maybe a few general remarks about the whole business, which is, I mean, you can see there is a kind of progression in this as we get more and more concrete. We have first citations. They appear as shadowy lines and things like that. Then eventually we get to real people. Uh, the next stage is institutions, and that's already showing up in part. Uh, it's just a fact, however, uh, and I have said this to these folks before, uh, if you're trying to understand what's going on, you want to know uh, who paid. The key question is always, in my opinion, who paid for this? Uh, and you don't know much uh, until you can answer that. Um, it is uh, extremely important to understand what was the pattern of NSF grants, which is a point I omitted some weeks ago. Uh, and we now know from Phil Morawski's work, say, on Friedman, the way he was, if you like, socially constructed by a right-wing foundation. Uh, that book of Morawski's is very little known, but it, should, it deserves much better work. I watched all of this because I taught at MIT uh, in the building next to the economics department. I taught with a lot of economists, I do to this day, um, and even some of my co-authors I talk to, it's interesting to hear their views on this. My sense of the discussion, I'm not sure I'm prepared to uh, accept, if you like, the uh, optimism, uh, not that I, if you actually look at depressions, I've done this a bit, uh, in the 1930s, you can see various people as they sink forever, lower and lower into the morass. Various people start looking at their economic theories and saying things like, you know, we could tweak this, and we could get a, general, a, a, general, a generally different policy for a bit. And then you get these folks, what, what typically happens in those circumstances is one after the other they start surfacing with things like maybe we need <coughs> to do some public work spending or something like that. Um, and everybody is celebrating this new view with a, as a step of almost unprecedented Napoleonic boldness. Then you look at the numbers they're talking about and they're laughable. Uh, it's like the central bank aid to the... Um, uh, Reichsbank in 1931, where, you know, so, oh, yeah, we'll help you out. We'll give you 100 million bucks. You know, that'll be gone in uh, three weeks. Um, and an awful lot of arguments go on over stuff whose quantitative significance is nil or close to it. Yeah. Um, and uh, which you never quite get to the sort of clarity you might. I, I am, for example, greatly impressed by the way. Uh, aggregate demand just drops out as a concept in most modern macroeconomics. Well, I, it's not just my view. I mean, I, I just taught a course again with my friend Peter Temin, an occasional co-author. Temin went through this at MIT. Uh, he has a very nice discussion of how that concept disappeared in, in his new book on uh, Keynes. And the striking thing is he has this little book on Keynes. Now, it's an ISLM version that I'm less happy with, but I certainly don't feel like going to any barricade on the basis of the independence of whether you can identify the money uh, supply or not uh, without, um, <clears throat> excuse me, whether, whether you'd have to have an independently identifiable money supply or it's endogenous, um, for example. Uh, but I, I rather, 
it's hard for me to believe that, um, I mean, we, well, I'm sorry, I should come back for a second. When we were talking this over, and Temin was telling me about the reaction to his book, he discovered that a fair number of the assistant faculty at MIT had never heard of things like the Swan Diagram, which is a sort of basic way you do world full employment. It's not the only way, and it has a lot of problems. It has maybe more of them than people let on, especially the Marshall Learner conditions for you know 40 countries. Who could believe that? Uh, and things like that. But the, this stuff has just fallen completely out of economics. Uh, and I don't, the notion that DSGE in any form brings it back in strikes me as fantastic. Uh, and, uh, you know, agent-based modeling is perhaps the way, the way you solve these problems in practice is you say, I'm going to do agent-based modeling. And then you just let the agents do whatever the heck you want on a model that you've designed to give you that result. Uh, it's, I mean, the, the sort of methodological studies here uh, that you sort of did, have just dropped out. It's like, it's just, I think it's really all ad hoc. But that's another, I mean, the notion that, I mean, this is just a comment. Uh, I think I'm just going to stop. Uh, and why don't the rest of you chime in uh, on this? Uh, all right, we got lots of time. We're not short of time. So I got, I mean, Janine. Thank you very much for organizing this um, panel. This was, I think this is a breath of fresh air and, 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 and importantly, something that I can use in my school next time I'm on the promotion and tenure committee and they're looking at um, the H index, which the last time um, I called it in the committee uh, preparation H, uh, which they didn't much like. Um, but I have a, a couple of questions for um, Carlo and then for Le uh, Leonard and Cornell. For, for um, Carlo, um, I was very interested in the, if you could say more perhaps about the history of the impact factor. And you mentioned just in passing a company that um, is perhaps responsible for doing those, did they, in, you know, when was that invented? Because audit culture, which you alluded to very briefly, goes back to, dates back to the early um, 1980s, as I'm sure you know, and then took, took off um, a, a, after, after, after that. So to know more about how that came about. And then also um, how it happened that, that, that books were totally pushed out of the, the picture and, and, only, and only journals included. Um, and then on um, Leonard and, and Cornell's work, um, very, very interesting and important. Um, is it possible, to, Cornell, to go to the beginning of your slide, sort of the, the third or so slide um, about the citations of IMF uh, publications? If I understood it, you had you had a slide with green and. Okay. Well, anyway, so you had you had a great slide with. Um, oh yeah, it's probably like the second or third. Okay. And it's I can't see it all from here, so I'm not sure. Yeah, there you are. Right. So you have I, that's IMF publications. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Right. And then you have these two camps, and you have the affiliations of the people in the camps. You have the academic affiliations. Okay. Yeah. Right, and just picking up on Tom's, uh, Tom's point, it would be very interesting to have the multiple affiliations of, of, of these people, if that makes sense, because some of them are, are, are affiliated with investment banks, other organizations, some of them, you know, th and they're funding the, you know, some are, uh, have, have grants from, from foundations and, um, you know, affiliated with the NBER. That would also, that would be interesting in, also in looking at um, at 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 at, um, at at impact and really understanding where the how the influence flows, another dimension. Thank you. And yeah. 
Let's take several questions and then you can comment. Yeah, Ed. I think this is really great work, and the, but the, the landscape is changing right now in an important way with SSRN, ResearchGate, uh, Repec, these people, it, it's as good as publishing, and it comes out right away, and downloads are the statistic uh, that people look at. But uh, I was going to make the same point about the NBER, but an and another uh, thing that, again, just going into the future for research is to deal with the editors. You know, that, that I've been involved with a lot of journals, and uh, every time there's a change in editor, there's an explosion in uh, the, the uh, uh, papers going in. And it's, it's partly, there is a, I guess, a filtering. As people get to know the old editor, they know there's no hope uh, of sending this kind of work to that journal. And then there's the associate editor linkages that would be really interesting to study. I mean, some people are essentially involved uh, on a whole line of research in any journal you might want to publish. So. Well, I want to raise two related points, uh, comments to, to which I would like to have the reaction of the, of the panel. So going back to the title of this session, we have the problem of distinguishing between bad and good economics. So as, as we know when we sit in the uh, tenure uh, committee or so forth, there is bad economics in heterodox camps and there is good economics in, in the mainstream camps. So I think there is this demarcation problem that we still we need to address. Um, because distinguishing between heterodox and non-heterodox might not be the only way to look at this matter. And secondly, I think more work is needed to do citation pattern in heterodox uh, economics, because we've done a lot in terms of mainstream, but we have not done enough. Because coming back to INET, it would be interesting to see what is new economic thinking. Does it come from heterodox people? And who are the heterodox? Uh, I think that this time, after five years, that we look at the pattern of grant giving in the INET and see whether you know there is some way to the, to identify what is being considered new economic thinking. And coming from heterodox camp, you know, I've seen so much old economic thinking as well going on. You know, people. I'm not necessarily pointing to a particular group. But so when we thinking when we are looking forward for new economic things, where are we picking things out? And so perhaps citation analysis might help us to identify the heterodox group in the way in which it's been done for mainstream people. Thank you. One quick comment. Yeah, we'll have to look at who's the research director. That matters. Um, hello, um, just a quick question. Um, you, you mentioned that everyone is unhappy with the way um, this um, tenure track and so on decisions are being made at the moment, and the way, like, like that, most economists are unhappy with the way we rely on these bibliometrics. But um, what is your opinion? Do you think that there's any chance that this is going to change in the next five years or so, or is it just going to get worse? Thank you. Okay, so that, so that just comments in line with uh, Thomas Ferguson's comments. That is, uh, indeed, we, we have a change in the last year. That is, uh, mainstream guys are much more stating that uh, in the SGE models, uh, in the last three years mostly, we could have a multiplier effect. But the mechanism behind this talk is quite different from the Keynesian mechanism. So that you have something which looks like Keynesian, but, and then open discourse introductions, you read the introductions of the papers, you believe that it's Keynesian, but when you try to understand how the models are working, it's not a me Keynesian mechanism. So that's ideas such as aggregate demand and other stuff. So I think we have a, a shift there in the way to 
with more distance with respect to what you say and what is in your model, because in fact, people are not able to check what's going on in the SGE models and the way they are estimated as well, because they use this uh, Bayesian estimation. In Bayesian estimation, 50% of your result is already what you decided it to be, that is your prior. So that's the first thing. And the other thing that I think could be interesting is that to, to check what was happening, do the same diagram in the period 2000-2007, see the location of the people, and now they change ideas. And you would see market change. So people who say fiscal policy does not matter at all, we have an agreement, Blanchard and so on in 2006, they change, you see, they change jackets because of the events. So just compare the same guys, and you would see, well, they were stating things very differently uh, than in the last five years. Okay, thank you very much. This is very uh, interesting uh, work. Uh, I am uh, Carl Sommers from the University of Amsterdam, and, and our graduate school, the Tin Merkin Institute, um, came up with a new journalist, not based on impact factor, but on article influence score, which corrects for self-citations to journals. And uh, that gives uh, a somewhat different ranking of journals, and I was wondering whether you are aware of any research in that, how, how that compares, and for example, how that compares in terms of mainstream journals and heterodox uh, journals. Uh, I mean, that has been a, an important uh, issue in our institute, and they, they are making arguments that the article influence score would be more objective, with which I actually doubt. So I, I wonder whether you are aware of any, any research uh, on this. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so the history of the journal impact factor is, is much older than, than you mentioned. Um, I see, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, the Institute for Scientific Information. What did you say? Did you so the, um, the, Institute for Scientific Knowledge was founded in 1960 as a private corporation. It has then been acquired by Thomson in 1990s, something of that kind, and is now part of Thomson Reuters, which is, of course, a private corporation, uh, even a, a very big one. Uh, they are aware of the new landscape, as you mentioned, and of the um, article-based measures rather than the journal uh, measures. In, in, in fact, they understand that a lot of the criticisms going on are well-founded, and this is a threat for their legitimate profit. As a consequence, they are trying to come in out with very many new measures. So nowadays, it, you, you really see everywhere from Thomson Reuters the warning that you should always consider a wide number of measures simultaneously because there's no single indicators. This is the new uh, wisdom of Thomson Reuters, which, of course, makes sense. Uh, several of these, um, of these measures are, of course, correlated. For example, you were referring to what mainstream people call pre-publication of working papers, but that's uh, been found out that, is a way, that that is a way to increase your own citations, because for the time lag that I was referring before, it's very useful to have your paper out before it's actually published, otherwise then it doesn't count. So uh, it's complicated, there is a whole literature on this. Uh, I would say that it, it's quite obvious to me that there is no single uh, measure of scientific quality, even because science, science is a multidimensional effort. I might be studying a topic for more than one reason, because I received the funding for this, I see some prospects of publication, I'm a genuine interest in it. Uh, I did my PhD on this. I mean, there may be many reasons, and even I, I look at the issue from a policy point of view. So governments may want to, uh, I mean, they might have a, a science policy in some countries, and they want to, maybe they wish to found research for certain uh, objectives rather than others. So um, I doubt, very much doubt there can be one indicator one day that will all uh, appease us. Um, I also agree that we need more research on the paradox field. Uh, it's one of the um, unknowns <laughs> of the presentation. We, we don't really know what the key figures now, for example, or what were the causes of certain breakups that took 
uh, plays in the past and can be very interesting. Uh, my last concern, uh, no, it is not uh, economists who are unhappy. It is indeed uh, mostly um, mathematics associations, physics and chemistry associations. So it's the hard sciences who are most criticizing these uh, metrics. Economists, at least in Italy, are very happy about uh, this for the reasons I was mentioning before, because uh, what you see today in a number of countries, I would say for in France, for example, is they, an, an overlapping of issues. On the one hand, you have this efficiency argument, the auditing culture that we are paid by the taxpayer, so we have to justify uh, our own work. On the other hand, it's a way of doing undercover academic wars. It's a way of uh, scientific cleansing of all the approaches that you don't really like. So uh, since you can show that mainstream people have more citations, it's very useful to use citations as a way to allocate funding. You, you can have you know, two very useful objectives with just one instrument. OK, um, some comments. Uh, maybe first, uh, I will add something to the history of Institute of Scientific Information. It's, I think it's interesting to see that the Institute for Scientific Information was founded by a librarian. And the original idea was to develop a tool to, <laughs> to help librarians decide on which journals to, uh, to subscribe to. So it was, so to say, more like an uh, institutional proxy for making decisions for librarians, and now it becomes an, an important, so to say, hegemonic tool uh, within scientific discourse. And uh, if you look in the past of, uh, so to say, uh, for example, in the 1980s, there was in economics some debate about our good journals, and I think the diamond list grew out of it. And if you look at the old paper uh, which developed the diamond list, you will find in the footnotes references to data from the Institute of Scientific Information. So the general routine was already established uh, 30 years ago. Um, regarding the downloads, I, I just wanted to point out that in scientometrics there is, uh, this is recognized, and there is this broad category called ALT metrics, alternative metrics, where, so to say, work is studying on that. But uh, I would keep in mind that you have the same problem of, of, of path dependency and self-reinforcing feedback mechanisms also with this kind of indicator. Then the question, uh, I tried to evade the question what is really good economics and what is really bad economics because I, was, I, was focus, I, I tried to focus really on the, on the fact that if we rely on citations as a proxy for quality, we get another self-reinforcing feedback loop mm -hmm. in the process of academic reproduction which is already strongly determined by feedback loops, so uh, by positive feedback loops. So you, what, what you would do is, uh, so to say, you, you will reinforce path dependency within disciplines if you, uh, if you increase the use of, of, of these uh, evaluative citation metric practices. And <clears throat> I think this, this, reason, uh, this kind of path dependency is also the reason why you find all these tweak DSG models. So if I want to, uh, if I, as it often be the case, I mean, there's the famous statement by Rose Friedman that she could always deduce uh, the economic, uh, she said, she, she, she can always deduce the economic attitudes of an economist from his political attitudes. And we see very similar thing uh, in, in DSG modeling. Okay, if this is a rather maybe critical guy, then he will tweak the model in a way that you have the reason for regulating finance, and the next one will come and tweak it in another way and say, oh, it's better we deregulate finance. So uh, you can tweak the model around uh, just in, to get a result with, with uh, confirmed uh, or with this in accordance with your political preferences. And I think this kind of model tweaking is not really scientific. Yeah? And the reason we have this kind of model tweaking is because if you want, uh, if you have a dominant political argument in the literature A, but you want to make the argument non-A, you have to do it in the exactly the same frame because of this path dependency. So what we have is a, a battle of tweakings and not a battle of theories or a battle of hypotheses. <coughs> and I think that's, a, that's the underlying problem. And I think this is generally a, signif a signifier for bad economics. So if we just tweak around to get the results we like. Um, regarding the, the heterodox field, I did some research on that a few years ago. <coughs> and what I found was that a typically heterodox journal has the following citation pattern. Uh, most citations come from uh, come from uh, mainstream journals. Then there are self journal self-citations. The next step is uh, sh citations from journals who belong to the same school of thought. And then at the very end, there come citations from other, so to say, heterodox traditions. So there's also uh, this kind of uh, lava networks of the same, uh, of the same school uh, within heterodox economics. And uh, I think this is also some 
significant, uh, so some significant for the, the problems in both heterodox economics. So you can say, oh, we are all pluralist and open-minded, but uh, we consist of different schools of thought who don't talk with each other, but everyone talks to the mainstream. So this is quite stupid, and this is an internal problem of heterodoxy. I, I wrote on that in the past, can send you a paper. Um, finally, <coughs> I wanted to say something on the self-citations. I think it's generally a good idea, the idea to correct for journal self-citations, but uh, you, have to, you have to consider a series of idiosyncrasies, just to give you one example, uh, the journal Ecological Economics. It's a really big journal with more than 1,000 articles per year, covering, I would say, at least 50 or 60% of the ecological economics field. As a consequence, this journal has a lot of journal self-citations, and I think it was even once on the edge of being banned from Thomson Scientific. Uh, it has a rather good ranking. It's about ranked number 25 or so, uh, but it has really, a really high number of self-citations. <laughs> but in this context, this is not corruption. In this context, it's really the fact that they have this one big journal for the field, and if it would split the journal in four journals, they would all uh, increase, so to say, in their ranking uh, if you use this correction uh, for self-citations. So, yes, it is a way to, to engage with this problem, but you have to consider a series of idiosyncrasies which are not easily, uh, uh, easily considered. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, um, on getting, getting a job, I mean, I mean I, I've been in committees um, in the UK and in Denmark, and uh, not in economics. In political, uh, uh, in political political science, and if you have a, 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 a article in a high impact journal, that now trumps having a book, in uh, in that field, which is I mean, and that changes only 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 really the last last uh, five years, I think. Um, trends trends and hiring, I think. I mean, in, in terms of it's here to stay, I think the, I mean, the answer is yes, I think, and it depends on the chair, uh, 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 of course. On good and bad economics, I mean, um, in our study, we have tried tried to think through what I mean the way I mean, I mean the way of treating good and bad um, in terms of orthodox heterodox is is a start, starting point for us, and we're not very ha happy with that um, uh, so far. And the um, and so what we're doing now is actually to trace trace change in the J I mean I mean trace trace change uh, across journals in the J in in the JEL codes. Um, and try and, and try and I mean try and try and try and try and try and try and see the system, uh, you know, I mean, and then choose 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 from these trends trends and changes in the in the codes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fabulous comments. Um, so let me clarify uh, something to address um, what what Tom and you have said. I mean, <coughs> when we're looking at this, uh, what we call left New Keynesians, we're looking at as if we were looking at the Khrushchev period versus the Stalin period. I mean, it's still, it's still uh, the Soviet system, right? Uh, but it's a sort of slightly more reformist, unstable. It can go into Brezhnev and stabilize into something really bad. Um, so we don't want to make a linear projection. This is going to get better uh, towards real Keynesian mechanisms, right? No, especially if it turns out that like, yeah. banks needing money coincides with a decision by the IMF or somebody or the BIS to use a model that allows some fiscal uh, effort. Exactly. So we do see we do this we do see this interesting um, interesting evolution, and it's more of a another metaphor is a, it's a palace war. I mean, most of the heterodox are not in the palace; they're uh, in the periphery of the of the town in, in in little huts, right? But these are the people inside the palace. And in my interviews with with IMF um, economists and the people who they cite, they say, you know, we we cannot. And there were some really interesting Keynesian people in the IMF, especially the young ones. They said, we don't have the legitimacy of saying anything in support for, say, public investment unless we bow to the DSG and we can tweak with it. But this is the legitimate language that gives you status in, in something like the IMF. You cannot get tenure in an economics department if you're a macroeconomist unless you, you use this language that gets you inside the palace. So there are very powerful structures in the profession that... that uh, make the transition from Khrushchev to Willy Brandt impossible, basically, right? Um, so another element is that uh, we're going to look at uh, editorial boards, right? And there is, uh, political scientists love to look at interlocking directorates in firms, and we want to apply that in the journals, because essentially this is uh, a kind of corporate governance uh, politics that we are going to apply. Um, following the money, the, uh, so we're going to match the NSF data uh, based on 
um, on, on funding macro, macro research and then with the specific articles that we find because they don't list they don't list the affiliation in the journal so we have to do the other we have to work on the other end um, the numbers for stimulus for example right it's important to look at the implications the numerical implications so even though they, they say public investment tax cuts for the young corporate income uh, uh, higher uh, wealth taxes right how much higher relative to let's say, the kind of numbers that people were using in the 1960s. So we're going to have this kind of benchmarking uh, to give a sense of how big this thing is. Um, what assumptions are shredded, shredded over time? That's really critical. Full employment disappears. It's not present in these models, right? So, I mean, this is a very big, different kind of Keynesianism we're talking about. And as I said earlier on, I mean, it's a kind of like Reagan Keynesianism. Give people tax cuts. Don't make the government too big by spending too much on government spending. And you see it in the structure of the stimulus programs, right? In the US, it's mostly tax cuts. It's not government spend, spending on, in the old Keynesian sense. Um, secondary affiliations, I think that's, that's really great. And that's where Land's uh, research on sequence analysis comes in. Because, again, this is just a, a ba very basic citation analysis, but when we go through people's CVs from the moment they got their PhDs to the moment when they are being, uh, they are being uh, published, we look at the revolving door, and, and Land published a, a lot on this, uh, a revolving door between uh, academia, corporate, uh, central banks, regulators, and so on and so forth. And we're going to find the specific patterns that go one way or another in the, in the connection between ideas and careers. Uh, so that's a very different methodology. That's why we use this combination of, of methods, uh, not just citation analysis. Um, and um, what economists change their mind? I mean, you're, you're so right. We have not coded uh, all of EAR before 2009. Uh, but in my other work for the, for the IMF, uh, and the people are saying, I mean, it's basically Blanchard and a handful, Hordi Gali and a, bl a bunch of people. Like, you can count them with the uh, fingers of one hand. And even they, I mean, they say, well, you know, in zero lower, lower bound, the fiscal multipliers are even higher, right? So it's a certain, it's a small crowd, which then becomes relatively more numerous uh, after roughly 2010, when they begin to, to do this. Um, and, and, um, the, the fiscal multiplier is not the old school, old Keynesian multiplier. It's a very different one. And if you take out the zero lower bound and, fi and financial frictions, the, the fiscal multiplier is not positive anymore. So that's why all of this hinges on very technical methodological recalibrations. If you take those out and let's say we don't have a zero lower bound anymore, then we go back to the old line, which is fiscal policy, yes. Uh, fiscal policy, no. Monetary policy, yes. Right? Um, and finally, uh, the sort of battle of tweakings. I, like, I love the idea. It's a really nice, catchy thing. And not a battle of theories. And it is a battle of tweakings, but if you talk to the, the people in the fund and you see when the fund does war on the ECB, right, the tweakings do matter. I mean, it's the difference between front-loading fiscal consolidation and back-loading it, right? Mm -hmm. And it, for those of us who are Keynesian hardcore people, you know, that's modest, right? But if you're the minister of finance uh, in an embattled country, it means a lot for you, right? So. We, we also don't want to downplay uh, too much uh, what these openings are, as, re as constrained as they might appear. Okay, we're actually well over time. I want to thank the panelists and the audience for uh, their contributions to this. I might make, by the way, one closing comment. In when you're trying to understand not citations, but who or what is giving money out, remember you don't see one variable that's really important, which is the amount of money requested. Uh, because it will turn out, when you start doing the history of grants, uh, if, uh, one, if, if the requests are for enormous sums of money, they're a lot less likely to, to uh, get funded, I think, just in general, ceteris paribus, other things equal. And so when you're trying to do specific patterns from, behave, from the revealed preference here uh, is an imperfect guide uh, to what folks are actually thinking or doing. Um.